morning, everybody, from right across the European Union and indeed around the world to the second day of the Art of Inclusion Conference, organized by the EASPD, ENCC, and COP Foundation. You're very welcome. Um, I'm sure many of you joined us yesterday with such a, an incredible and inspiring day around messages of arts and culture. And today we have two fantastic panels and again, a set of workshops um, up until the afternoon on how the arts empower people and services. Over to you, Carmen, thank you. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Owen, and thanks, uh, Ana Rita, for this uh, wonderful uh, morning booster. I think there is not a better way to uh, to start like um, a, a panel. So, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will just remind you a little bit on how this is going to to work. Um, if you need subtitles, you can activate the closed caption uh, in the bottom, um, using the button at the bottom of your screen. Then we have the chat and we also have the questions and answer. Um, so um, panelists will do their presentation. Um, you can post so the questions you have for them uh, in the chat or in the Q&A um, uh, functionality. And we will also open uh, a questions and answer session at the end of the panel. So therefore, welcome to, to this panel um, that it's called, how can the arts empower people and, and services. Frida Kahlo said, fit, what do I need you for when I have wings to fly? For this renowned Mexican artist, her lower limbs were never helpful in discovering the world, not to interpret it. However, art allowed to express herself, her emotions, and elevated her to the pinnacle of the Latin American surrealism. Frida is not alone. Of the more than 1 million people in the world who live with some form of disability, more and more are finding a vehicle for expression and social inclusion through creative and cultural industries. Art is fundamental for social inclusion because it's part of our popular culture, which builds the narrative of who we are. Arts allow persons with disabilities to not to have disability as the only label. And we will see a lot of good examples of this in this panel. Also on how arts and, and its power to transform services. I have here with me today five fantastic panelists from different parts of Europe. Let's start our empowering journey in the UK. So Frank, Frank is with us today and he is professor and dean of research and impact in arts humanities and social sciences at Ulster University. He's also a composer and a researcher. So Frank, can you tell us more about your fascinating work with the music and technology and, and, and research? The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the invitation to speak to this. Uh, um, amazing topic. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a short presentation here. Yeah, so this is a topic very dear to my heart. I've been working for 20 years um, in this area of um, what I call inclusive creativity. So I'm Frank Lyons, as you say, I work in Ulster University. I've worked at um, the, the research and teaching aspects of what I've um, entitled inclusive creativity. 
Inclusive creativity for me, it aims to explore creative technologies to level the playing field for people of all ages and abilities who wish to compose and perform music. And of course, we have the evidence to demonstrate clearly that this type of inclusion and participation is absolutely an empowering force. The image you'll see here is just one of the um, pieces of, of music technology that uh, we use in some of the work that we do. And you can see this in action in my workshop later. Um, this image is, I think, very telling. It shows a, a number of um, performers with a variety of disabilities um, performing with uh, a, an ensemble that we call Zero Sum. And so this was part of an inclusive creativity project, uh, which brought together a, an ensemble called the Kustronic that I talk about, and an ensemble called the Bayonis String Quartet, who are a professional string quartet. And what you see here is the combination of acoustic and electronic digital instruments being performed by the ensemble. So I'll just talk a bit more about the ensembles that I've worked with. It's all about participation. It's all about group work. So this ensemble Acoustronic um, was formed in 2014, 2015. And as you can see, it integrates musicians with a range of abilities. It combines acoustic and electronic instruments. And what we have cultivated is a collaborative approach to composition, improvisation and performance. So all musicians are included and um, all musicians are offered opportunities to lead. All musicians take part in composition, improvisation and performance. I've used this term living lab because essentially everything we do is research focused. And so essentially it's this um, constant live approach to um, working through research topics and questions. This group has performed in professional settings in Derry, Dublin, London, and Lisbon. Award winners, they've won um, research impact awards. They've won arts and culture, people of the year award. They're actually, as far as I'm aware, the first inclusive ensemble to be made ensemble in residence at any music conservatoire anywhere in the world. Acoustronic or ensemble in residence at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. So again, it's an acceptance and a recognition of the inclusive work that they do and actually the quality, the professional quality of the work. Um, we're working currently on a very high level uh, commission for a new piece for um, the National Symphony Orchestra here, the Ulster Orchestra. And they've received and we have received project funding from a number of key funders. Moving on, and one in particular will be very familiar with this group, the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland is a project that was driven initially by the Royal Irish Academy of Music and Ulster University to bring together um, musicians and inclusive ensembles from the four provinces on the island of Ireland. And again, it, it, it takes this approach of inclusive creativity using digital instruments and the options that digital technology gives to uh, young musicians in terms of composition and performance. And again, you can see here that it's um, very, very high profile. And it, we're now moving into what we see as the future of creative technologies using immersive technologies, which include virtual reality and augmented reality. So this idea of empowerment, we're all involved, uh, including the, the, the musicians in participant led research. That's very, very important. They take leadership. We're involved in really innovative cutting edge music making, as well as the development of new innovative creative technologies. We've also seen that, that these musicians, uh, perhaps with learning or physical or disabilities, you, they're able to develop high level technological skills through their interaction with computer technology in terms of their instruments. They all testify to the idea of increased independence and confidence. This allows a showcase for their creative talent and their increased confidence. What we've also found is support services have had to raise their game to, to match the demands of the, the musicians that we're talking about here. 
you know, so we do see improved services and new recognition of the creative potential of some of these musicians. And we've also raised funder expectations. We've made it absolutely clear that working with projects like the ones we do, inclusive projects, probably takes a bit more um, money than any other projects that they fund. So we've had real success with funders in terms of using the, the new talent that we can showcase to increase the levels of funding that we're able to tap into. So I think that's, that's the end of my presentation. So I'm happy to uh, move on. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, we will. We, I think we will cover more later in the in the debate because you just mentioned how support services need to adapt. I think mm -hmm. that that's an, a very interesting uh, uh, a contribution. We can elaborate uh, a little bit more later on. Uh, so let's go now uh, to to Greece. Uh, Daphne, uh, we have with us today Daphne Economo. Um, she is the chairman of the uh, organization Cerebral Palsy Greece, and she has uh, a wide, uh, a long experience in the, in, in the world of, of arts and, and, and how art can empower persons with disability. So uh, Daphne, uh, over to you. Thank you, Carmen. Hello, everybody. And thank you for inviting me to speak at this wonderful conference on the art of inclusion a subject that is very close to my heart. I wish we could have all been there together in Cork. I love Ireland. And here is my Irish friend at the Open Door Center. I think you will know who he is. To begin from the beginning, I am the mother of a little boy with cerebral palsy. We had our little boy, Thamos, with us for 17 years. From the moment of his premature birth, to the night when his brave, loving heart stopped beating in his sleep and he slept on. Here he is on his first birthday with his brother and sister. The years that we spent with Thermo were the most wonderful and meaningful years of our lives. He gave us so much, he taught us so much. We learned from him that love with no conditions, love as a mutual need can truly exist and that what is precious and true can never be lost. He taught us that we cannot solve all the mysteries of nature and that time must be allowed to play its role. But most of all, he shared with us his joy for life so that not one moment of his brief and short life was wasted. Close to him, we were educated, helped and healed. This was the inestimable gift of an exceptional human being. Thermos was profoundly physically impaired, but he was totally and wonderfully complete as a human being. With him and because of him, his father and I founded Cerebral Palsy Greece in 1972. And after his death and in his memory, we continue our work learning from people with disabilities more and more every day. Nothing gave Thermos greater satisfaction than the recreational play groups that we set up when we founded Cerebral Palsy Greece. I am going to the kids, he used to say, and his face would light up with joy. Up till then, children with cerebral palsy were usually caught up in an endless round of therapeutic sessions with all the stress on their physical function and no time to play or have fun, no time to sing, to dance, to make book pictures or to tell stories. So this brings us to the theme of our conference, the art of inclusion. And the topic of today's session, how can the arts empower people and services? I think the answer is quite simple. Art is a definitive element in the life of every human being. And all of us at some time in our life have felt the need to dance and sing and to play act. That is, to allow our imagination to carry us beyond the boundaries of everyday reality to an imaginary world that can be shared with others. Clearly, this primordial need for artistic expression 
is deeply embedded in our nature and in the collective destiny of the human race, where we are all included. More than anything else, it empowers us to look further. In Australia, song lines not only carry songs and stories from place to place, but stake out imaginary, invisible boundaries. Centuries before man learned to write, he painted the elements of nature that surrounded him in order to worship and appease them. And the wild horses immortalized in the cave paintings of Lascaux are still roaming the flatlands in the south of France. And what can we say of the beautiful painted swallows of Sandorini that are still flying in the sky? All nations in the world celebrate the coming of spring with carnivals, dressing up and masking as a fundamental need for regeneration. And in ancient times, these ceremonies constituted the birth of drama. In The Merchant of Venice, Shakespeare writes, the man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. Let no man, let no such man be trusted. An ancient Chinese proverb says, the dynasties depend more on music and ceremonies for their survival than on force of arms. And Carl Gustav Jung wrote that the debt that we owe to the game of imagination is limitless because every inspiration and every artistic expression has its source in our imagination. Young children play imaginary games when adults do not hinder the scope of their imagination through over-rationalization. It is their way of extending their world beyond the limits of what is possible and what is permitted. Even today, if we leave a small child alone in an old unkempt garden, it will soon start enacting a new role, will find imaginary companions, and will discover a brave new world of its own creation. Myths and legends are another rich source of artistic expression. They provide us with a sense of measure, and they remind us not to challenge the gods, not to fly too close to the sun, and never to profess to know what lies in the future. The ancient Greeks believed that Ephestos, the wisest and most ingenious of gods, was a cripple. It makes you think. Myths record events that caused astounding changes in the way humans feel, think, and act. And the story of the human race has found wondrous expression in poetry, music, drama, dance, and painting, and remains an inspiration for artistic creation in every generation. We all know that play and creative activities are essential for the development of a child's personal identity. And as I have mentioned, Cerebral Palsy Greece's first initiative at the Open Door Center was the establishment of recreational and artistic programs for children with cerebral palsy. The results were immediate and astounding. Our children made incredible breakthroughs and found ways to express their inner selves as unique individuals with an indisputable right to a place in the sun. And over the years, we have watched our children and adults, our staff and volunteers, change and develop as they discover not only hidden talents in themselves and others, but also achieve self-confidence, social graces, and balanced human relationships through music, dancing, acting, and art. We have witnessed every day how art can empower people and services, and over the years we have put this belief strongly into practice with inclusive artistic activities for all ages at the Open Door Center and a series of artistic workshops for people with and without disabilities from all over the world that have left their imprint and have been widely emulated. <laughs> So it is up to us to foster and develop the creative talent that exists in children and young people with disabilities 
by allowing them the opportunity for artistic experiences and the scope to express themselves freely, freely through art. Nothing is more tragic than a missed opportunity. If we are to empower people and services through art, we do not want artists with disabilities to be delegated to a separate category as special artists or their work as special art. It is essential that both the enjoyment of art and the expression of art should be inclusive, involving disabled and non-disabled people as equals and as co-artists. This is the only way that we could learn from one another and develop appropriate services. Before closing, you will allow me just one more consideration. Creative life always stands outside convention. For the exceptional person to be nothing but conventionally normal signifies stagnation and immobility. So we must allow ourselves and others to be much more than normal. There must be no limit to the possibility of surpassing ourselves. And finally, all we need to remember is that along with our biological development, every human being needs a world of the spirit too. And that in the footsteps of our lives, we should not underestimate the development of other wondrous abilities of the mind, the heart and the soul that for many of us and particularly for people with disabilities may have priority. This is what we learned from our beloved child, Thermos, then, now and forever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lux. It's a, it's a beautiful story, but also it's something that it has a, a very strong message behind, um, especially in these difficult circumstances. No, I think we, we need to recognize the importance of arts, and, and but also in support services in, in these difficult days when uh, we are, let's say, some, somehow going back to, to the basic needs. It seems that arts and culture uh, is, is not there anymore. No, it's something like a, a additional accessory, and it's, it's not like that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's absolutely uh, needed, essential. You know, the need and essential. So I think uh, that's an extremely important message for all us to today, and especially uh, for, for uh, the policy and decision makers. No, I think uh, um, it's something we need to take with us today. Um, so um, you also mentioned, Daphne, the, 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 the power of, of art to transform also the, the, the services and uh, how artistic thinking uh, can make things change. And Yvonne knows a lot about it. Um, Yvonne, you have been working uh, and using the arts and artistic methods at, at something else. Uh, so uh, please l tell us uh, about this, this wonderful work uh, you do uh, uh, in Ireland. Sure, way. so um, I'll just share my screen. So um, have, I, have you got my screen there? Has everyone, can everyone see? Great, thanks. Um, I'm just, I've got two slides and I don't pretend in my case to be um, an, an expert in the arts and disability. Five years, I've been deeply involved in projects with people with uh, disability. And I want to just talk in generalities first about what I think I've taken away as an artist researcher from those interactions. I think um, in this slide, I talk about artistic thinking and doing, and I'll just take uh, that little anecdote from the American experimental writer Gertrude Stein. She was accused repeatedly of her writing being unreadable and impenetrable because it was experimental. And in one of her works, uh, she writes, my writing is as clear as mud, but out of mud run rivulets of clear water and I knit them together into a river of metaphor. And I think it's really important for us to think about how artistic practice with people in marginalized positions challenges us to navigate the complexity of their um, artistic production 
and challenges, challenges us to knit together concepts and practices that are usually seen as being distinct from one another. Um, and through so doing, the artistic production of the people we work with, of disabled artists, um, and the people they work with can be transformed because we listen to what that production does and how it challenges us to celebrate other kinds of creative power. I think that then when we're thinking about service provision, artistic thinking really makes space for us to literally hear voices and to facilitate the emergence of um, individual voices. What I've found in my work uh, is that I've learned, and I know this is true for many panelists, much more from artists with disability than they have learned from me because I've had to open my mind to my aesthetic value systems, the things I think are beautiful being transformed by how people with disabilities unique intersection of their genetics, culture and bodies uh, um, uh, uh, enables them to create differently. And so what I've become very interested in is the unique virtuosities and the idiosyncratic beauty of the utterances of the people that I've worked with. And my, um, uh, my passion has become how we find ways to celebrate that unique beauty in uh, alternative ways by drawing from the history of the experimental arts in particular. So the project, the big project that I've worked on in the last years that have brought me to this point is my project Resident Tales. Now this project began because we were invited uh, to improvise with children with what in English is called profound and multiple learning disabilities. And just that category is super interesting because the category of PMLD, as many of you will know, doesn't refer to anything specific. All it describes are people whose disabilities are complex and intersecting and, um, and profound, whatever that might mean. But, uh, um, but other than that, the children in schools and environments and adults in schools and environments with PMLD uh, share um, little else in terms of who they are because their intersecting disabilities can be so different from one another. And that means it's a space of uniqueness. It's a space where we get to uh, um, have the privilege of being with bodies who are emitting and radiating unique expressive powers because of their intersecting disabilities. I work with the voice. And so I was very interested in the unique kinds of vocal sounds that these particular uh, um, children uh, emitted. And I found the vocal sounds as a vocal technician extremely challenging to imitate. They're very exciting and they challenge me. Some of the children have different anatomies. They make vocal sounds that I literally cannot make or imitate. Um, so we developed an interface environment for the children that would echo their vocal sounds and send them back to the children in touch. Uh, uh, so we use vibration, immersive vibration interfaces inside polycarbonate balls, light, the light brightness and colors change according to uh, their vocality and an echoing sound environment that allows them to bathe in their vocal production in a kind of echoing universe. You can't see it here, but a furniture console that looks a little bit like a 1960s liquor cabinet. And we apologize for that. It was because it had to have design characteristics that allowed the adults working with the children to access the controls very easily. But that console rolls into a room, the lights shut off, and we try to transform the space into a theater of the voice that celebrates the children's unique relationship with focal production. There are two key principal takeaways from the work with the children so far. One of them is that they are virtuosically able to engage with non-puncte time. And I borrowed that concept from um, the neuromusicologist Alex Khalil. That essentially means if normal time goes punk, 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 their time needs no punk. So they can indulge in long soundscapes of beautiful sonic production and change those soundscapes into touch and light in ways that normatively configured or typically configured adults especially can't do. 
And the second is that, again, their unique psychoanatomies give them incredible vocabularies. Now, it, sonic vocabularies. Now, if you're interested in alternative artistic production, the kinds of sounds the children make historically were sounds you would definitely not bring into a restaurant because they would be embarrassing or too unusual or put you on the spot. They would exhibit um, disability in ways that cultures uh, used to, and in some cases often still find embarrassing. But these incredible vocal sounds for me allow us to literally hear what the children, was a part of where the children's passion lie and give them moments where we can celebrate the, the power they can have over their own bodies when they're subjected to so much medicalizing all day. In the schools we've worked with so far in our independent evaluation, the four schools we've worked in have transformed some of their speech and language therapy and communication strategies. They've transformed educational values on some level. So there are schools where children have vocalized for the first time or vocalized at length for 45 to 50 minutes for the first time because of this interaction and where actually their uniqueness is celebrated in a whole other way. And our schools are able to take those, you know, uh, the schools are under so much pressure to evidence learning in order to achieve their funding. And we've been able to provide them with other parameters for showing how um, what might in other situations be considered non-speech like focal production can evidence the achievement of an aesthetic sophistication. And I love that phrase, aesthetic sophistication, that takes uh, us beyond uh, our normal value systems with regards to what matters in voice. Because if everyone's voices matter, everyone's vocal sounds have to as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really fascinating. I, I already knew your, your work in, in this project. And I think uh, you mentioned this, the concept of uniqueness. No, in, in this world when uh, all of us want to be the same, I, I think it's, uh, it's much better to, to be a little bit uh, unique. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you, you mentioned, um, uh, Yvonne, the, 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 the power of art to, to, to transform services. Also, Frank mentioned that mm -hmm. how support services need to, to adapt. Uh, well, maybe Nora, uh, you can tell us uh, a little bit of, of what that means, no? how a, a support service provider uh, take this uh, on and, and, and create uh, uh, services for, for persons uh, with disabilities. Uh, so Nora, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I try to share my screen. Okay, and I hope it will work. Uh, okay, great. So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Nora from uh, Budapest from Eta National Association. Uh, the first time that I met people with disabilities was at a rehearsal lots of years ago. It was a rehearsal of an inclusive band where all the singers had some kind of disabilities. And it was incredible and uh, inspiring for me how the singers were on the stage with lots of energy and humility. And that was the time uh, I decided I would like to work with people with disabilities. Uh, I'm working as a project manager at the National Association. We are a non-profit, non-governmental organization, and we provide professional assistance, assistance to our member organization who mainly support people with intellectual disabilities. We have 60 member organizations across Hungary, so we care for about uh, eight and 9,000 people with disabilities. For us, it's, it's really important to support art activities and artistic careers. Uh, we can set many good examples through our member organizations. Around uh, 50 uh, of the 60 member organizations do art activities, and the 15 of the 50, uh, 50 organizations give people with disability the opportunity to do uh, art activities in supported employment, so they get payment for their work. And uh, I can say that at most our member organizations, the art activities have an important uh, role in their daily life. Uh, we sup support the, uh, uh, our member organizations uh, by organizing uh, different applications and the program for supported employment and art activities. So this is how we could uh, support them uh, financially. 
uh, we gave the opportunity to show their handmade products at exhibitions, our events, and festivals. So, so they can also sell these products so they can get income for their work. And um, uh, we give appearance opportunities for art groups at our events. We think that the uh, art activities give the people with disabilities the opportunity to show their talents. It uh, helps them to spend their free time usefully and differently, give them a bigger chance to have a complete life. And I think the most important that it can be their work also, so they can get payment for their artworks. So people with disabilities have the opportunity to make their own money. And I think it's, it's really good and really important. Of course, uh, we have lots of challenges because there are few uh, artists who have time beside their official work to collaborate with a nonprofit organization for an extended period of time. So they are opened, but uh, but we could can understand that they have uh, endless time to do this uh, volunteer work. I can speak about uh, lack of experts who are good good uh, also art also in art activities or lack of proper places equipment or materials because these are uh, can be really expensive and of course I could speak uh, of uh, lack of financial support but uh, I would like to speak more about good practices from our member organizations so let me introduce you first the never give up band and the never give up gospel choir from never give up foundation this band, uh, in this band, the musicians and singers with disabilities work as professionals, so they get payment for their work. And this band has many, many concerts in Hungary and around the world. They were in China, Russia, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, Transylvania. And uh, I can introduce you the Never Give Up Gospel Choir. Uh, where the people with and without disabilities sing mainly gospel songs together and the choir has many concerts in churches and festivals and they also uh, perform yearly at the National Theatre in Budapest and I, have, I am a member of both uh, uh, group. And how it can uh, empower people and services uh, beside that the people in this get payment for their work. People in this group can find a good community and good friends. Uh, the attitude of the community is open to change through listening and watching these concerts. Lots of people decide they would like to volunteer in this foundation after listening to the concerts, and the foundation can collect money for good aim through charity concerts. The second good practice is uh, later 92 foundations fine art camps. They hold the inclusive camps for people with intellectual disabilities and so one second, do you mind to speak a little bit slow for the captioners? I'm so sorry, yes. Don't worry, so, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, they hold uh, inclusive camps where people with uh, intellectual disabilities and the students work together. The aim of this camp is to help uh, people with in intellectual disabilities express their feelings like everybody else. Uh, this camp has been organized every year and after this camp, the foundation organizes an exhibition displaying the creation what are made, how it can empower people and services uh, beside the useful leisure. Everybody can create according to their talent. It's an integrated camp, so it helps promote the inclusive arts. The attitude of the community could change through working together with people with disabilities and through visiting the exhibition the cre of the creation. And the foundation can gain income by selling this creation. And uh, beside this creation, they made lots of handmade uh, jewelries and uh, other products. And these are wonderful also. And uh, I would like to introduce you my last uh, uh, good uh, experience, uh, good practice, sorry. The Cloud Workers Drama Team uh, from Foundation for Disabled. Uh, this drama team was founded in uh, 2003 with the aim of broadcasting basic human feelings through gestures and body language. The members of the team are adults between the age of um, 50 and 45 who are, uh, sorry, 20 and uh, 45 who are mentally and physically challenged. 
people with disabilities also have the desire to find a way and be open to the world of uh, majority society. They long to express themselves and to present their values. The performances of this group is unique nationwide because it is a speechless theater which conveys essential feelings through the power of movement and gestures. There are no language barriers or, or borders. How it can uh, empower people and services. It helps the social acceptance of people with disabilities Stage for them is a source, source of happiness, such a motivation that makes everyday life, their everyday life meaningful. And performances are meetings where friends, acquaintances are made and the world opens up. I could speak to you about more and more good practices for our, our member organizations, but I only have eight minutes. So thank you for your attention. Sorry for my fast speaking. But if you have any question, do not hesitate to contact me or you can ask here also. So thank you for this opportunity to the ESPD and the interest groups on ours. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in, in, indeed, it, it, it's great to, to see uh, how your member organization has um, have embraced art as part of the of the normal activities, not something exceptional. No, that this is a, it's really amazing, and we have a similar case in other parts of Europe. Now we move to France. Um, Yusra, uh, you uh, work as um, a project manager also at uh, Centrale Gabriel in, uh, in in France, and you also. Uh, since many years have decided, let's say, that arts are, are extremely important for the services that you provide. So uh, please tell us uh, more about uh, your good practices there. Hello, everyone. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Carmen, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'll just be sharing my screen. There you go. All right. So uh, I would like to tackle the question of empowerment um, through one key concept, which is co-production. So what we have been uh, witnessing here in Saint de la Gabrielle, um, we have indeed two structures that offer uh, cultural services. One is uh, Foyer Accueil du Jour, Accueil du Jour, with the uh, daily activities. And the other one is Foyer Arrivi with people living in there and uh, having their life project built around the art projects. So um, here we believe concretely that arts does empower through what we have been witnessing, which is a changing behavior among our users in the sense that as the, year go, as the years go by, they're actually the one uh, telling us what they want to see, what they want to produce and what they want to experience so uh, I just, I'm gonna be very brief. Uh, I just have three key examples I would like to share with you. So, um, so this first project is called La Lenteur des Nus, and it's a dance project uh, that we have been producing with the choreographer Lotus Ederhuri uh, by the end of September. And what happened here is that uh, people that we are supporting asked to go in the public space and to um, dance in there. So uh, it was a very nice project that the idea was just to picture how daily life follows, follows its course and how everyone's difference can be um, fused into this one object in the sense that uh, it's like an anarchical, an anarchic kind of crew where everyone's difference can still work uh, and that the boat, let's say, of this anarchic crew won't um, sink. So uh, the idea would be to reproduce again this, this, uh, this experience here in Clay where we are based 30 kilometers away from Paris. But given the circumstances, uh, I think it's going to be, might be complicated. But uh, anyway, so the, the second project I would like to talk about is this one. It's a photography project called Tout commence par une image. Everything starts with the picture. And it's a, like, it's a follow up of uh, an artistic residence that we have been organizing in 2019. And what happened is, 
after this first uh, experience, uh, people, uh, our users ask for second editions. They're the one who wants to follow up uh, the project with uh, a kind, it, it, it will be sharing stories through pictures. So once again, we are the one simply providing the service, but we're not the one uniquely uh, producing the program. So that's very important to keep in mind. And uh, well, last but not least, this very fascinating uh, project that um, I would like to talk about, the planetarium project. So what happened here is that we have been working with uh, a Parisian university, University of Paris uh, of Sergi Pontoise, with the Department of Physics. So the users have been um, following uh, sessions, video sessions, uh, video conference sessions with students, um, master students in physics, and just exchanging information, asking questions, and turning them into, into artistic productions. So I find uh, the questioning rather even philosophical in the sense that here, I need Raoul asking, is, there are different times in the universe. Uh, Jean-Claude Risson, if there are flowers on Mars, got some more. Uh, this one I really like too. At what distance from Earth are we no longer subject to its gravity? And uh, the last one, can the Big Dipper constellation move? So why, again, am I sharing with you this, um, this project is just to let, to tell you that power comes with the ability to express, to share, and not just to be passive um, in the experiences that we are organizing. So it's a, it's a real bottom-up um, perspective, dynamic, that for us really does answer this question of whether or not arts do empower. So we strongly believe in that. And thank you very much for your attention. It's going to be very brief since I'm the last one. I don't want to bore you, but I'm happy to take any questions you have. Perfect, Yusra. Thank you very much. Um, and I indeed, I think I will. I will. I will um, take the, the. I will now open the the, uh, the questions and answer session. So please, uh, everyone that is it's following this panel, uh, you can use the chat. You can use uh, the Q and A feature. Uh, so don't don't be shy um, and then put your your questions there. Um, but I would like to start with something that, that indeed you, you, you mentioned. You, uh, you said that artistic design and artistic thinking also provoke somehow the way you were adopting co-production in your services. The same, uh, Frank and Yvonne uh, mentioned that you from the other side, let's say from the art side rather than the service provision side, you saw how services adapt. So maybe I will start with, with Frank and Yvonne. What kind of changes uh, happen, let's say, to support services in, in your project? How did you witness that? And how did you, from the other side, let's say from the art world, were able to interact with, the, with those service providers? Now, if you can briefly comment on that, Frank and Yvonne, and then uh, I will give also the, the floor to uh, the other panelists. Okay, Carmen, thanks. Maybe if I go first, Yvonne. Um, yeah, I, I think the key, the key issue that some of us have, have highlighted is that this is kind of new and possibly a bit strange to the normal types of service expectation um, that people in the services would be, would be accustomed to. So it's all about, I think, bringing, bringing in the service providers where possible to allow them to share the experience. So in terms of, you know, uh, uh, carer provision, for instance, it's it's a lot to do with involving the carers in the actual creative process as well and getting them to enjoy it. And then they see the benefit that it has. It's also about um, making sure that the, the, the expense of this activity is realized as well. You know, if, we, if we're bringing, um, you know, 10 people with disabilities and caring requirements on the road to tour, like, you know, in a, in a band or whatever, you know, it's about making sure that the information is related very clearly in terms of what the expectations are. They're usually vastly different from 
what service providers would be used to. So it's, it's about spreading the information. It's about involving them almost in a participation level for me that has driven real change in the, the service providers that we work with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Frank. Yes, that uh, it's art as, as a driver, right? Yeah. Um, so Yvonne, uh, what did you witness during your project? Sure. I think this is very similar to Frank. In our case, um, early on in the Resident Tales project, it's had three phases. And early on in the project, in our first pilot school, we just recognized to what degree the day-to-day -day service providers had to be involved in what we were doing. And um, because the project works, the, the way that the users, the artists like uh, uh, engage and understand that the echoing interface is echoing them is through an intensive interaction with a human first. And um, so in the second phase of Rising and Tales, we focused almost exclusively on developing a program for staff rather than for the users. And when the staff started to engage with that program, we were able to understand what they needed and um, the pressures on them. And then uh, um, what kind of service provision we needed, needed to them so that they could engage artistically with the children, which made them, which then allowed, uh, uh, seemed to facilitate um, the service providing staff to have new ideas of their own about how what they were doing with our work could change how they operated in the school. And um, our external, uh, um, uh, we have an external uh, sort of monitor, an analyst who comes and watches what we do. So we're not just reporting on ourselves and, and them as well, noted a number of cases of where that made a real change in both educational provision and even sometimes in the shape of the day of the students and particularly in how people engaged with speech and non-speech sounds from their service provision perspective. Um, so uh, non-verbal speech sounds in some of the schools became much more important than they had been before and were used much more for uh, communication than before. Thank you very much, um, Yvonne. Um, I think we, we find a good link. We also have a, a question uh, in the question and answer session. Um, people are asking how the UNCRPD, if the UNCRPD uh, changed your approach to art as a service provider. So the human rights approach meant something for you as service provider. Uh, maybe Daphne, you would like to, to, to comment on, on, on this? I think it's very important that the ASPD has gone into the arts because it could so easily have um, focused elsewhere. And it's a wonderful thing and that we have all greeted with enormous joy that there was this conference today because um, so much like what the two previous speakers have said, we had to convince people um, of the importance of art in our services. It was not taken for granted. And it is wonderful for our children and young people, but as uh, Frank said, it is wonderful for our staff as well. And um, I think that the, the fact that uh, this association now is focusing also on art, of course, there are other, other questions too, is, is supremely important. And, um, and of course, Ireland is the place where this should happen. <laughs> I mean, Ireland is the place where uh, this, this, this was, could be recognized. All the meetings I've been to in Ireland, there was always somebody singing a song or, or, or reciting a poem. And um, the, this, this importance of art in our lives uh, was always there, even if we were talking about completely different things. So yes, I mean, keep it in our programs, keep it focused because we all need it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daphne. Uh, uh, indeed that message, uh, I think that was, um, that will be the, the also one 
coming from our panel, no, the, the, the importance on, 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 of arts also in service provision, of course, this is uh, extremely important. And maybe uh, from that perspective, we also have a, a question. Um, Yusra and Nora, um, someone is, is asking, as a service provider, um, how do you support persons with disabilities to, to embrace art, but moving from a, from a passion to, to a career? Uh, Nora, you mentioned the career development opportunities you have in, in ETA. So, I don't know, maybe you would like to start, uh, Nora, with this. Uh, we have to be very brief because we have only four minutes left. So, uh, I think uh, if I speak uh, about people with disabilities, uh, for them, the art activities is a passion. So, uh, so I think uh, for them, it's more important to, to do this activity, like thinking about that uh, it's my work. But uh, so when I, I, so I think I can say that I, we don't have to ask people with disabilities to do art activities because uh, they want to do it uh, from their, their heart, from their soul. But it's, uh, it's an uh, additional thing that they can get money for it. And I think if we would like to, to uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, turn it into the job. It's it's very nice because uh, it's an additional thing that they can uh, get money for it, and uh, and they can change through it the attitude of the community. That uh, yes, uh, yes, we can we can do it also. So I think uh, it's it can be a very good message to the majority society, and I think this is the uh, more important message that that uh, the art activity can be a work. Thank you very much, uh, Nora. Um, what about uh, Centrala Gabriel, Yusra? How do you yes. support? I, I, I second Nora on that position uh, in the sense that here in Foye, our rule that is not the main goal since people that come and follow uh, the cultural program in general do have a parallel job and this, they come for their passion. But within La Gabriel, we also do have a whole professional, professionalizing kind of aspect through our integrated um, uh, company specialized for people with facing uh, mental disabilities. But uh, culturally speaking, we do not put the lucrative dimension in the center of our activities. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yusra. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it's quite clear the, the, the reply that, that you gave. Um, Indeed, I think uh, we have seen in this panel that art is a, is a catalyst for positive transformation. Uh, either you want to make your career out of it or not. I, I think uh, leaving the possibility uh, for the person to, to choose, uh, I think that will be uh, the, the, the right way to do it. But if the person wants to uh, pursue a professional career, I think uh, there is a still perhaps a long way to go. Uh, from all different perspectives in society, from service providers, from educational providers, and, and, and even the artistic providers uh, uh, as well. Um, I think we have also seen um, uh, this, this power of positive tran transformation in, in services, um, and we have some example of, of this. Uh, also, the importance of, of art for decision making, uh, to, to, to allow people to take decisions and that's extremely important uh, uh, nowadays. So I would like to conclude by um, saying that in many occasions uh, we, we, we felt untouched uh, by, the, by the problems or the challenges of, of others and arts can make us felt. So um, this felt feeling uh, may spur thinking, engagement or even action. And we would like to stay with the last, with real action. So uh, be unique, embrace your art, and embrace art. Thank you very much to all panelists. And now I give the floor to Amy, uh, because uh, we have also some beautiful piece of art. Eh? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>